All right, hello and uh, welcome to the second in the Waterloo AI Institute's webinar series entitled AI for Managers and Executives. My name is Peter Van Beek and I'm co-director of the Institute along with my friend and colleague Fakri Kure. Today we have two presentations. Uh, each presentation will be 25 to 30 minutes and then followed by about 15 minutes of a Q&A session. Our first presentation is on absorbing and scaling new technologies, pitfalls and opportunities. That was the working title, and this will be led by Professor Wayne Chang. Uh, Professor Chang is a faculty member in the Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business here at the University of Waterloo, and he's a member of the Waterloo AI Institute. Each year, Professor Chang works with over 100 undergraduate students and teams developing their startup business and not for profit ideas. And Professor Chang also works with graduate students, and you'll you'll meet three of them today. He works with graduate students in the Masters of Business, Entrepreneurship, and Technology program, known as the MBET program. The graduate students in the MBET program design AI workshops for specific industry sectors, and they work with local external startup partners to create AI strategies. Today, Professor Chang and three of his MBET students will tell us about this work on creating AI strategies. So please, please take it away, Professor Chang. Great, thank you, Peter. I will now share screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, um, let me go to screen mode. Okay, thank you, Peter and Thackeray um, and the Waterloo Institute, AI Institute for the opportunity to be part of your webinar series today. Um, this presentation outline. I will go over quickly the course of which the embed students um, took with me and um, they will actually in part three give examples of applications of AI uh, technologies and products. Um, what I've done is um, we actually have a full time embed program, which is one year, but we have a part time program and Esteban, Kristen and Stephanie are full time um, staff at the University of Waterloo and the part time program runs for three years, but in the first year of the program, they take a course with me called Entrepreneurial Applications of Technology, and the technology that's designed into the course is actually AI. And so um, from that piece, they actually um, get oriented with reports, understanding how it's applied, and a lot of terminology and literacy around it, but they don't create AI. Of course, people at the AI Institute and yourselves actually are in that um, realm. Um, but what they do is they have a project where for half of the course, they're in consulting teams and they work with a local Waterloo Region startup to develop some of their AI uh, strategies and market analysis. OK, um, so first um, I'll start off with a quick reference. So this just came out um, a couple of weeks ago. It's the Element AI Global AI Talent Report and quoted from Betakit. Um, Canada is the second leading country that has AI researchers. And I think the Waterloo AI Institute, along with the partnerships and collaborations that um, you as the audience um, members and companies have here are well positioned to develop that even more formatively here. Um, so it's a great sign. I'll jump into the Gartner hype cycle. This is probably a familiar concept to most of you. Um, Gartner um, puts out annual uh, reports similar to this, and then they populate on what's called a hype cycle curve. Um, the locate the, the timing and the positioning of the di different technologies. So in the plot, it's an XY plot of expectations versus timeline. On the left hand side of the peak is what's called positive hype as you go up the peak and then on the right hand side it's negative hype as you go down in the at the peak it's called the peak of inflated expectations it's overhyped and then um, as the technology moves through the curve there's a trough of disillusionment where people have misgivings about whether they've made the right choice of developing the technology into products or services and then should diffusion and adoption to mainstream take place then it moves to like um, the far to uh, right um, two sections of the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. It's um, it's sort of a guide. It um, I have another chart to just show some of the dots of the specific technologies, but it's not guaranteed that something on the left hand side of the hype cycle curve makes its, its way all the way through to the right side. Um, many new technologies, um, emerging technologies, AI technologies are on this curve. And they have different symbol colors representing a time window estimate of when they should move through this curve to the far right for main adoption. However, this um, trough of disillusionment is a location where it's like the valley of death. A lot of stuff actually ends up fizzing out or petering out in that spot. So from this um, hype cycle AI report, which came out at the end of July, 
Um, they notice two mega trends. One is the democratization of AI, and the second one is in the de industrialization of platforms, so that to, to make it more industrial scale. And so, um, covering some of these things, these are some of the selected types of technologies that I just pulled out from that chart, but the chart is referenced. You can click on the link and the slides are available, and you can take a look at the different um, listed technologies. There are many. Uh, for positive hype, I just put down artificial general intelligence, and the time box they put in there is more than 10 years before it becomes mainstream. I will defer to Peter and uh, the researchers um, at the AI, Waterloo AI Institute for more accuracy on the, these pieces because they're in this space for the, the, the formative research and development for the innovation types of technologies here. At the peak of inflated expectation right now per the psych, hype cycle AI report is Edge AI. And they say it's, it'll take two to five years before it moves over to be more mainstream. If I move over to the negative hype as this peak starts coming down, uh, machine learning, chatbots, computer vision, these are now kind of common terms, so people are not hyping it anymore. Does not mean they're going away. They just means that the negative hype is that people are becoming a little bit more tone deaf about the terminologies because they're becoming more mainstream. And they, they also bucket these three specific um, technologies to be pervasive in the next two to five years. Um, for some of you or at the AI Institute here, that could be sooner, um, but depending on the applications and the programs you're developing, okay? So for the um, two mega trends, for the democratization of AI, um, the report actually states that instead of having specific subject matter experts in sort of like a walled off area, developing, creating, and using the AI for specific applications and products, it now that the AI now touches outside of those walls into like most sectors, um, people, customers, business partners, salespeople, different parts of the value chain in a business or an industry. So it's become, it's, it's democratic. And then they quote, for this to become a major force for the democratization, they foresee developers or tech talent being a key piece, okay? On the other mega trend, the industrialization of AI platforms, um, as the platforms now are large um, places uh, visually to have products built on top of them, then they believe scalability takes place and safety of AI becomes much more of a higher priority. And then adoption and growth is um, kind of when the platforms are available instead of uh, single use or single products or niche products. And in this quote, they say responsible AI and AI governance actually becomes kind of top of mind um, to make the industrial scale um, take place. Okay. So the reports are actually um, available through Gartner. Um, I think you have to subscribe to get them, but um, they have a bunch of other reports on different things, but it's handy to see the visual. And depending on the company that you work with or the products you're looking at or the technologies that are being developed, some tech companies for the Waterloo Region startups, they look at the hype cycle technologies and they try to roadmap how to plan in the future to adopt some of these technologies or invest in partnering with companies or other entities to try to leverage the, some of these new technologies, as well as partner with the Waterloo AI Institute as well. Okay. Um, this is related more in the pandemic. There's actually a plethora of reports that have come out from all of these big four uh, strategic management consulting companies and um, industry and market analysis consulting companies. I'll just pick this one. Um, since the lockdown happened in North America around March, um, there was a lot of like mode of circle the wagons and try to figure out how to survive and adapt. But it turns out that the, the acceleration of AI adoption will actually take place because of other constraints from this um, COVID-19 post-pandemic mode. So in this Bain report, which came out in May through the summer, um, they surveyed companies on the left-hand chart. They asked them um, if you had to adopt AI, which means they, they ha they're not adopters yet, what would you use it for? Would you use it for like cost reduction or would you use it for like to build and expand on new customers? And as you can tell that it's pretty much 50-50, but I think if they ran the, re the survey again this fall or next year, I think the, the, the split outs would be very different. I, I think you'd see more expansion on new customers because you have to have different ways to reach new customers creatively than the traditional methods previously. And the right hand side, the plot shows for those that um, actually are interested in adopting AI, they ask them what their constraints or challenges are. Tied for first is insufficient talent to take advantage of the opportunity. So again, the Waterloo AI Institute here, the researchers, um, the talent pool and the training, also the partnerships that you guys um, work with the Institute for are positioned actually to um, be addressing this constraint. Okay. Um, McKinsey actually put out 
puts out an annual global AI survey. So this one came out last year. So this is before the pandemic. And this is one of the plots. Actually, she's definitely be discussing some more of it in her presentation. So this is a global report with over, well, it's well over like 2,500 uh, respondents. Uh, the 1,800 that replied here are the ones that actually have adopted AI. And they're from companies around the world. And this was, um, as they surveyed them, they said what percentages of revenue increase within the year took place within these kind of categories and by the degree of the percentages. So marketing and sales has leveraged AI the most. Um, communications, digital platforms, um, omni-channels, et cetera, and then developing new products and services and so on and so on. And the link is here at the bottom. Uh, the, the report is actually also quite informative with many different uh, facets um, that explains different pieces of people who have adopted AI. So uh, the last report actually came out from the McKinsey Global Institute from McKinsey, and this was a large um, report. So it's kind of prescient because it predates the big surge that's now taking place with um, AI and a lot of the Institute's um, activities taking place here at Waterloo. Um, when they wrote this in 2017, it's, it's a large report. It's about 80 pages and actually the students in my course actually have to read this and they go through sections of it as they get grounded in the terminologies and different things. So um, on the left hand side, they kind of categorize into three buckets. Um, adopters, low adopters, medium adopters and high adopters. And high adopters are tech first companies, automations, assembly and fintech companies. Um, it's interesting back in 2017, they listed low adoption as education and healthcare, but we live in a different time now with the pandemic in 2020. Um, this group actually, a, a bunch of them are actually moving fast now into the high adoption rate, of course. And in that report, they listed six key characteristics of AI adoption. So this could be, if you flipped the view, this could be a pitfall. So checkboxing the six, um, if the strategy to adopt AI is to do a, a growth instead of a cost reduction, then they believe the adoption is actually more formative. So that's just something to keep in mind, but I'm, I'm sure as you read the report, it is, it, there's a lot of insights on the different pieces and they break out each of these sections in more detail. They cover retail sector, health tech sector, automation and different things for that. Okay. So this is actually my last slide before I hand it off to Esteban. So in that report, they actually go through um, like a, a path. You start off adopting AI in the far left with some very, very specific use cases. You have to inventory and analyze the data sets and the database of information that your company collects. And then the technology and tools pieces when they identify specific um, AI tools that can be leveraged. And notice it says partner or acquire a plug-in capable gap. Um, so partnerships such as the research collaborations with the Waterloo AI Institute here actually will leverage this piece as well. And the next one really is workflow integration. This one's a tough one because as more automation and streamlining takes place, there is a negative consequence of like the labor workforce actually may shrink. So the offset to that would be the, the types of skills from the previous labor workforce um, is a different set, but there's opportunities here for the newly trained, newly like tech talent in um, technology, ML, AI development space. Okay, so that's all the slides I had for now. So in terms of like pitfalls and opportunities, I hope you had a chance to just scan some of these um, concepts. And these are larger views of um, reports, but um, Esteban and then Kristen and then Stephanie will actually go through some example use cases um, for a deeper dive. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Esteban Ventimilla and I am a full-time um, em employee at the University of Waterloo. I'm also doing my part-time Masters of Business Entrepreneurship and Technology and on the side I'm completing a micro Masters on Data Science and Machine Learning. So uh, today I believe that it's essential to understand how AI works to uncover its opportunities and pitfalls. So that's why today I'm going to be going over a worked example from an MIT course uh, that helped me understand the fundamentals of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. So sentiment analysis is a common application of AI. 
So basically is when you're giving a piece of text, uh, you want to understand if the piece of text is positive or negative. So as you can uh, guess, this is very common in reviews. So it can either be a movie review, a product review, show review, basically all kinds of reviews. And today the worked example is going to be coming from a movie review. Hopefully most of you have heard, like at least heard about uh, the Joker. So if I give you this couple of pieces of text, uh, us as humans can just read it and completely understand if this is uh, either a positive or a negative review, right? In the first one, I, I can cover the stars um, and the rating, but if you just read perfect in every aspect and truly a masterpiece, you already know that this is a positive review. Then on the other hand, we have a negative review clearly by the first sentence saying, I thought this movie was complete and utter garbage. Um, so that is something that we as humans uh, can do automatically and can do perfectly. So that was actually the AI approach that people started using in the 1970s. Uh, it was basically, we understand that we as humans can do it perfectly, but how do we do it? So that's when they started analyzing, um, okay, what do we do when we're reading a review? Uh, we're actually looking into specific words that would like highlight if it's a positive review or a negative review. On the first example, it would be like masterpiece. And on the second one, it would of course be uh, garbage there. Um, and now that we know how we do it, now we try and program this, right? We write a code for an algorithm that does the exact same thing. So uh, we make a list of words that would make for a positive review. We make a list of words that would make for a negative review. Uh, then we take on the reviews and, and we break it down into words, right? After we break it down into words, out of this list of positive reviews and negative review words, uh, we try to count how many positive reviews do we have in this review here? how many negative words we have in this review over here, and then we try to make a prediction. So as an example from this, uh, you can see that the machine will be able to pick up, you know, masterpiece, the best, again, the best, remarkable, and then give it a rating of like 10 out of 10. If it says it's the best, it's gonna have to be a 10 out of 10. And then second, if it says it's gonna be a complete and all garbage, then it can pick out and say, okay, there's a one out of 10 rating, um, but, there is actually like limitations to copy humans. So what words do we actually like look for, right? We have to decide uh, what words make for, the, for a positive review and try to make an exhaustive list of, of these words, right? So this was what people try to do in AI and all applications of AI, um, make an exhaustive list, but the success rate wasn't the best, right? It was a 60% success rate. And keep in mind that if you flip a coin, you have already a 50% chance. Uh, so clearly not the best. And again, as I mentioned, it was the same problem for, for every application, right? In computer vision, uh, you had to make an exhaustive list of geometric figures to look for. For a driverless car, you have to understand what is a traffic light, what is a street light, what's a tree, all the types of trees. What is everything that you encounter while driving? So you will be able to, uh, to create a drive in this car, right? So clearly there was limitations there. So here is when, um, when we updated this. Uh, believe it or not, we were stuck there for, for years and years. Uh, and even if this doesn't sound like completely impressive to you, it was very impressive at the time. But basically what, how it works today is that we're learning instead of programming. Instead of coming up with a list and trying to find those words that you put in that list, we actually make it an empirical exercise. So this is basically based on observations, based on experience, based on our experiment, right? Uh, we collect data, uh, we learn from this sample data set, and then we make predictions out of this data. So artificial intelligence is basically turning an intelligence task into an empirical learning task. So, uh, you start by specifying what needs to be predicted. Uh, predicted. So that would be the Y variable. So the Y variable in our case would be, is this a positive or a negative review, right? Then you specify what is used to predict this Y variable. In our case, we're using words or combinations of words to predict if it's either a positive or a negative review, right? Then you collect a bunch of data, which could be, let's say, 10,000 movie reviews, and using this existing data, you understand the relationship between the y variable and the x variable and with this understanding you build a function that can actually come up with proper predictions and this is basically what's driving innovation in this uh, in this sector the ai sector so if you think about siri which is voice recognition recommendation systems which is like your netflix your spotify 
Amazon, everything has recommendation engines, driverless cars, face recognition, chatbots, out of correct. Everything is being done by collecting data, learning from the data, and predicting how the relationship from the Y variables and the X variables work. So it is not a coincidence that AI and big data arose together. So now that you understand how the AI fundamentals work, I think this will be an amazing time for Kristen to share some of the top business functions impacted, impacted by AI. Thanks, Esteban. Um, as Wayne said, um, uh, my name is Kristen Brown. I work full time at the University of Waterloo uh, and I am a in my second year of the three year part time MBET program. So I will share my screen now. And can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yes. OK, perfect. So I'm going to, as Esteban said, spend the next five minutes going over the top two business functions uh, predicted to have the most beneficial impact uh, from utilization of AI. So let me just make sure that's clicking through. There we go. So AI's application to real world business problem extends across nearly every aspect uh, and every sector of the economy, but the biggest impact could arise in two particular business functions, marketing and sales and supply chain management and manufacturing. As you'll see on this slide, there are a few key subcategories in these business function areas which have the most significant opportunity for return on investment in AI. For example, in marketing and sales, AI can be used for personalization. For a brick and mortar retailer, AI could match up SKU performance and customer data to personalize promotions for an individual customer. An example of supply chain management and manufacturing is how AI is used in forecasting. In the customer packaged goods uh, industry, for example, AI can turbocharge efforts to forecast production failures and schedule interventions further reducing downtime and operating costs while improving overall production yield. I now wanna share with you a real world example. So Lowe's has partnered up with fellow robotics to create the Lowbot. This example highlights the use of AI in marketing and sales in their customer service management, as well as supply chain management and manufacturing in inventory optimization. In 2016, Lowe's introduced the Lowbot, an autonomous retail service robot. This robot is able to find products in multiple languages to help customers effectively navigate the store. As Lowbot helps customers with simple questions, it enables employees to spend more time offering their expertise and specialty knowledge to customers. Lowbot also assists with inventory monitoring in real time, which helps detect patterns that might guide future business decisions. Though this is a great example of the utilization of AI in both the top two business functions, given the cost and difficulty to replace humans in diverse tasks, it seems these bots are likely going to remain in a niche for the next few years. I'm now going to share a quick video with you so you can see the Lobot in action. And I'm just actually going to quickly stop sharing and then share again because I think I forgot to include audio. There we go. All right. So we will go there now. All right. You want to make your home better. Our job is to help you. So we're building new tools that help our associates help you better. We partnered with fellow robots to bring you Lobot. We spent close to two years honing Lobot and soon it'll be coming to select low stores to help you. Hi, I'm looking for some paint. Need to find something? Lobot can show you and in multiple languages. Lobot also helps our team by constantly monitoring inventory, giving us daily feedback about what is in stock in the store. 
All of this allows our staff to focus on what they do best, helping you. So what's next for business and AI? Uh, now it's the time to do your homework. Take time to get familiar with the tools and technology utilized today, where it's going in the short term, and what sits beyond the horizon. Focus on data availability and acquisition, data labeling, and data governance to make sure that you have a leading edge data strategy. As we'll hear from Stephanie, data is going to play a key aspect in the effective implementation of AI. Finally, think laterally. Keep an eye on those who are the trailblazers and the pioneers. What are they doing in your industry or similar industries? This will help boost your odds of staking out first mover or early adopter advantages. In closing, this is a list of references for you uh, from the presentation. Primarily the data for this report uh, was pulled from the McKinsey 550 report, Real World AI, as well as Lowe's innovation site. Thank you for your time. I'll now pass things over to Stephanie. Hi, thank you, Kristen. So my name is Stephanie Brunzma. I am a part-time MBET student in my final year. Sorry, I'm getting a, an error. Um, I'm in my final year and I'm also a full-time employee at the University of Waterloo. Pretty excited to be here today and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the data barrier to AI deployment and value creation. So in the 2019 McKinsey survey that uh, Wayne had talked about earlier, uh, what I picked out was this, this questions where respondents were asked to reflect on their organization's ability to look at or take in AI tools or across uh, different aspects. And most interestingly is the 4.2 times greater response rate from higher performing AI organizations, stating that they have a standard AI tool set for data analytics and professionals to use. Now, like any tools, and I'm really excited about Kristen's example, is tools are only as good as uh, as the environment in which they're in. You know, a Lowe's hammer or a hammer from Lowe's and rebuilding your house is no good without nails. So too is AI a tool useless without correct and accurate data. So data is really kind of in and what inhibits organizations from accurately uh, taking their data, labeling it and using it efficiently tends to be infrastructure and legacy systems. It can be very expensive um, and the moves to create agile systems are slow in our lower performing corporations. Here's an example of a data tool uh, that Cinnamon AI has developed called Flax Scanner. Flax Scanner is a tool that can look at PDF documents, Word documents, uh, print, hand print and hand uh, script, as well as fax documents. And it can analyze those documents and create uh, different applications based on, on the customer's preference. Some exacting key points from contracts, invoice registration, and extracting handwritten text. You can imagine what this would save in terms of administrative burden at a traditional organization. So when it comes to data, uh, looking at data tools can really add more value to an institution um, if the right AI tool or the right partner is chosen for that application. I also wanted to pull out some other examples from you where uh, different corporations are using data uh, analytics tools, data mining tools um, and, and anal analytics, pardon me. So Walmart is using HANA. HANA is a, a tool from SAP. The reason Walmart chose HANA is because HANA can process uh, hundreds of thousands of data points in real time um, and send that across the organization. So Walmart has the ability to pivot and make decisions in real time based on that collected data. Um, and then when 
when it comes to General Electric, General Electric has done something quite different. They have developed an in-house tool, Predix, that they uh, then license out to other corporations for applications such as monitoring oil pipelines, aircraft landing gear prognosis, um, and component analysis of uh, commercial trucks, including uh, predictive maintenance and anomaly detection. Uh, so, you know, going off that General Electric uh, example, General Electric did very well because they chose a vertical. Uh, for them, it was industrial applications and they developed a tool within that vertical. vertical. So too can uh, enterprises look within their organization and look for those verticals in which to insert um, AI technology such that they can readily access data, analyze that data, and make decisions based on that data, and most importantly, uh, monitor or evaluate how those decisions were made um, and if efficiencies were gained. The next thing I, I want to talk about is the what can corporate leaders do to build a data architecture to drive innovation within your organization. So the first step to that is develop a test and learn mindset. So optimal designs that lead to lengthy uh, decisions uh, made by committees and lengthy uh, budget approvals. Um, eliminate those and instead create teams that have access to smaller budgets um, and the agility to create minimum viable products or can these teams string together open source tools um, that can quickly demonstrate value to the organization. Next, establish data tribes. So take your data steward, your data engineer, and your data modeler together and put them on a team so that they can create a standard repeatable data feature uh, and engineering process. Next, in develop, uh, invest in data ops, which is development ops for your data so that you can accelerate design development and deployment of new components within your architecture. And finally, create a data culture, one where your employees are excited to analyze and use data within their own job. Um, do this by creating a data strategy that aligns with the business strategy. Um, and that has to come from the executive level uh, and down throughout the organization so that how data, you know, that, that culture where everyone in the organization is then thinking of how that data is collected um, based upon how that data can be used to make future decisions um, and greater benefits for the organization. Finally, I've created a list of companies that offer specialization in, in, in data management, so data mining, data management, and also data decisions. Uh, what's really interesting is the breadth of these companies in terms of how long they've existed. So you've got some um, startup companies to scaling companies to uh, names that we've known and grown up with for um, numbers of years. And finally, my references, uh, the AI guide to developing at scale was used significantly similar with uh, how to build a data architecture to drive innovation. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Wayne and Esteban, Kristen and Stephanie. So I'd like to open it up for questions. We do have time for questions before the second presentation. Uh, let me start things off. Uh, so uh, the, the surveys, so what, what did you learn about the reasons for failure? I know companies often don't speak about that and they don't acknowledge it, but uh, there, there's failures in AI, but there's also disappointments. It didn't, it didn't do as well as they had hoped. And uh, that one is quite common because of the expectations are extremely high. Um, so do you have any comments on that? Sure, Peter, I'll jump in. Um, so I worked for a Silicon Valley uh, tech company and they follow like a technology roadmap for industry, uh, semiconductor wafer fabrication. And when you have an organization that needs to move rapidly or quickly to transform to adopt new technology, it's either a top-down approach or you have distributed all through the layers of everybody with buy-in. And so usually for incumbent organizations that the AI technology is very new to them, there's going to be a transition period or a gestation period, and that's common, it's culture. Um, in the McKinsey trend report that I showed, the high adopters were technology first companies. So it turned out by saying, oh, we collect the data anyways, we just don't do training data or ML, then it, it was easier for them. For incumbent industries, which were less technical, 
the adoption rate slower. And approaches to that is you either retrain staff, which is costly and kind of like a, a big investment, or you adapt by introducing core products that everybody knows is kind of vital to the company. So core products and services is a big piece, but the other one is the culture of the company. If the company is not used to turning every three, like there's three months or a quarter on a dime to do new things, then it'll be difficult to adopt a very innovative new technologies, for instance, um, like AI. But I'll open up to the um, presenters if they have the comments as well. So I'm making an anecdotal comment that it's culture related, but it's also the piece of how um, fluent that company is about technology. Great, Esteban, would you like to comment? For sure, yeah, I, I would fully agree with what uh, Wayne just mentioned right now, but of course I would go back to like what I mentioned in my section of the presentation, like going back to the fundamentals and understanding how AI works. I think it, it basically comes down to the data that you have available and making sure that you have enough data and uh, and basically the correct relationship between like uh, what's explaining the data, what's going to be like the predictor that you're going to get uh, from that data. Um, that would be one of the main uh, success, like key factors that companies need in place for them to be able to use and leverage AI uh, and meet those expectations that they have when they actually do it. Kristen? Yeah, I just uh, echo again what Wayne and Esteban said and what was very clear in Stephanie's presentation about the importance of data. But I think uh, when you look at adoption as well, like Wayne mentioned, um, if you know some industries are going to be more susceptible to transitioning into being able to make change very quickly, um, other industries not so much. And so if you're part of an industry that is not uh, regularly used to making quick changes, uh, that's a whole culture shift and that's that's a really big change that has to happen um, right off the hop um, in order for the whole organization to be able to follow suit. Stephanie? And I might jump in, Peter, sorry, sure. uh, to follow up on Kristen's point, that's it, why some larger companies end up not retraining their workforce or their talent groups, they just acquire startups. <laughs> it's one way to actually affect that change is to, is to merge with another organization that has that capability. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. I think the uh, the other thing that I saw really common upon, among those failures are the legacy systems. And so companies choosing to purchase systems to work within their legacy systems that didn't quite have the outcomes or the efficiency that, that they had predicted. Um, or, you know, and it kind of fed back into that culture where employees are saying, you know, we said this didn't work, it's not working. Um, and the other thing about that, those legacy systems is they are now lacking the speed and the capacity to operate with those newer tools. And that's really creating a barrier to realizing the full capability of the AI tools. Okay, thank you. So we have a question about, um, can you elaborate about the data science platform infrastructure at the University of Waterloo? And if this platform can be accessed by, accessed by industry partners, I, I think I can answer that one is that we use uh, whatever is available and mostly we use open source and so it's freely available for everyone. Um, we don't have, uh, we, where there's a, there's many machines uh, that are used to train, train our models and such and the, um, but as far as I know, they're not open for industry. Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody. Um, but maybe I could turn this question around a bit and say, um, what have you learned about open source versus proprietary? So with my own students, it's Python and machine learning libraries in Python. It's uh, it's what they they gravitate towards. Um, what what have you found in your in your research? Do people do our companies using open source products or are they buying proprietary tools? I can jump in quickly. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, please do. Yeah. Um, I found a lot of recommendations in those articles to use open source tools, especially to create kind of agile teams or create that culture of uh, employees have the ability to to take an off the shelf product and quickly adapt it to their needs within the organization. So that was one of the uh, significant recommendations, um, um, not just in the one, but in the many uh, articles that I went through was open source is, is a great way to go. Yes. Uh, Kristen, do you have any comments? 
No, I don't have anything else to add. Okay. Stephanie's comment, I think that was great. All right, thank you. And I, I see that uh, we have uh, another question here. Maybe I, I have a comment that for Kristen, and maybe you could speak to it briefly while I read this question um, for myself. Uh, so the reason why companies do AI, they, they talk about cost reduction, they talk about expansion of their customers, expansion of their products. But the Lowbot, the Lowe's example, it struck me that a lot of companies do it for branding purposes. They want to be seen as the leader in their in their field, right? So I would go to Lowe's to see the robot. Um, so is is this more widespread? It's my perception it is, but can you comment on that? I think, you know, from a business perspective, being the leader in anything is going to bring you some competitive advantage. And so if, um, you know, you're one of the first bricks and mortar store to have a robot in your store, absolutely, you're going to drive traffic there because people are, are going to want to see that. Um, and then when, you know, they get used to the benefit of it too, you know, I, you know, I really appreciated that video because we've recently done some additional work on our home and I remember going into Lowe's and you know we're looking specifically for one you know wall sconce that was supposed to match the others and we only bought four and we needed five um, and then you have to go back and kind of sort search through everything so I do think there's a real advantage from a customer service side of things and then very clearly um, from an inventory management system that's um, you know a real pain source for some of those larger big box stores but Absolutely. From a competitive advantage point, if you can be the first to market with something really cool, like a robot, uh, people are going to show up. Yeah. Thanks. So a question for Esteban, uh, um, one of our uh, participants, for one of our viewers. So it, the, if I summarize it, your, your definition of AI seems to say AI is machine learning. Is, is, that, is that a position you want to defend? Um, is it or is it is it more than that? I, I would say like you can say it's it, it's a subset of it, uh, of course. Um, but basically, it's that's the basis of it. That's like the fundamentals, like where we start uh, with machine learning and AI. Um, some people use it interchangeably, uh, but of course, I'm not gonna say uh, every like every AI is uh, machine learning. There's different applications to it. Um, so hopefully, that's uh, that's clear. I will let anyone else like add a point to that. Jump in, anyone? Nobody wants to defend that that position. Okay, very good. <laughs> I'm glad that question was asked because I I also had that question. Okay, so a, a question here about so many companies want to use AI, and again we've gone over the reasons for it. Um, is there any experience that can be shared to effectively? Um, drive for adoption and how do you get to inter say internally to a company how do you get the upper management to buy into ai so certainly the the techie types are all in on this um is, is there anything you can say about getting internal adoption uh, going yeah uh peter i'll jump in with a commentary so a lot of innovations take place because of a crisis or a constraint if we were in a utopian world and I wanted to develop like an avatar that could speak six languages and teach my son to pick up like Latin and French, but there's no constraint that he's motivated to do it or et cetera. Um, I think the companies have to do an inventory or a self-assessment of like what their constraints they have challenges now with and what tools they think on the, the sunny side of the world will help them to get to the other side. If it's just a cost reduction, circle the wet, like circle the moat just to protect against competitors, that's a different behavior and strategy that the companies adopt. But if there's a constraint and look at the pandemic, who knew video conferencing like this or Zoom or Google Meetup would just take over the world? Um, and I think when the Gartner hype cycle came out for like video conferencing a few years ago, they said adoption would be very slow because there was no real demand for it. And then what happened with the pandemic and everything worked from remote, video calls, everybody's re rethinking that this is a tool that's going to be transformative to support the work environment. So I think identifying the key constraints in your industry sector and what you can do with new tools then kind of motivates the culture to say, we need to do this as opposed to, I don't want to do this. I've done X, Y, Z the same way many, many years. Show me a reason, a compelling reason why I should change my behavior. 
that position is difficult for leadership to get around. But if leadership says, we have an opportunity here, the constraints are X, Y, Z, you all know it. How about we all jump on board to figure out, do this kind of like a, a positive way. And then you trigger some experimentation, like Stephanie said, you have to experiment. It cannot be a top-down design that's execution perfect, 10 out of 10 actions. There has to be some experimentation that takes place. And so that'll be difficult for some cultural environments where experimentation is not encouraged. Um, some sectors, it's like every decision has a consequence that's dire or perceived to be dire, then it instills on the employees not to take risks. Okay, thank you. I, we've come to the end of our time, unfortunately, but also fortunately, because now uh, we hear from Pascal Pupar. So uh, thank you, Wayne, Kristen, Esteban, and Stephanie. That was very enjoyable. So thanks for your participation. Thank you. So our, thanks for our having second, us. Yes, you're welcome. Our second presentation is on real world successes and failures for AI technologies and will be given by Professor Pascal Pupar. Uh, Professor Pupar is a faculty member in the Cheriton School of Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. And he's also a Canada CIFAR AI Chair at the Vector Institute and a member of the Waterloo AI Institute. Uh, Professor Pupar has won many awards for his research, uh, and I won't go over them all because that would take up his time, all of his time <laughs> if I went over them, and is internationally renowned for his research in AI. And that, that international reputation is a, he's done a, a wonderful theoretical work, but he's also done very interesting applied research. And he's going to talk more about the applied side today, I believe. Uh, so he served as research director and principal research scientist at Waterloo Borealis AI Research Lab, which is funded by the Royal Bank of Canada. And he's also served as scientific advisor for a number of companies, Pro Navigator, Element AI, and Dialpad. And his research collaborators, and this is where I established that his, his bona fides with industry, if I haven't already, is that it includes Microsoft, Google, Intel, Ford, Pro Navigator, Sport Logic, Scribendi, Kick Interactive, Slice, Hockey Tech, and the Alzheimer's Association, the UW Schlegel Research Institute for Aging, Sunnybrook Health Center, and the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. So Pascal has done a, a very interesting uh, applied work on AI in, in, in a lot of different sectors. So uh, welcome, Pascal, and uh, please uh, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, let me share my screen here. Um, I guess, yeah, I'm going to share my desktop and then let's go into the full mode. Just a second. Okay. All right. Can everyone see my screen well? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so yeah, so th thank you, Peter, for the introduction. So I thought as well, I just put up a slide here that um, uh, includes uh, some of the uh, industrial collaborators that I've had over the years. And, and I guess what I'll talk about today is inspired and obviously biased based on the experience that I've had with these industrial collaborators. But I should also say that I won't be able to talk about uh, much in terms of uh, the details of uh, their products and so on simply because I don't have permission and a lot of the, the work uh, had to remain confidential. But in any case, uh, I'll try to make this interesting and where I can, it, it turns out that out, out, out there there's actually sometimes more details about the failures. So that's where we're, we're going to get a little bit more concrete. Okay, so uh, for for the talk, I'll talk about first about some AI successes, and, and I'll ask the following question as well. Are we experiencing a technological singularity? So I'll explain what that means uh, in the coming slides. Then after that, we'll talk about some AI failures and then some of the challenges and, and research that are currently done to address this. Okay, so let's take a step back. Let's go back to 1965. So there was a very interesting book, uh, actually not a book, but a, a research paper that was published by Irvin John Good. So he was a mathematician and the title was Speculations Concerning the First Ultra-Intelligent Machine. And then, so in this article, uh, what he was describing was essentially the singularity, meaning that uh, there would be in the future some uh, AI that would abrupt, uh, abruptly trigger some runaway technological growth. Now, he wasn't being too precise about this, and obviously 1965, this was very early on. But if we fast forward a little bit, 
Um, so there's also Ray Kurzweil, who's a, a computer scientist and inventor and also a futurist at Google. And, and then he, he uh, did a lot of work in terms of um, uh, defining what the singularity might mean. And he also wrote a book uh, in 2005 claiming that the singularity is mean, is near. And here, um, what he was really talking about is um, uh, the fact that um, when we have some technological progress, um, we develop some, some new capabilities, some new technologies, and then we can build on those to essentially accelerate progress. And then, so one thing that he observed is that uh, when we look at human progress, so it accelerates according to some curve. And at any point in time, uh, we often make some predictions by looking at how things progress in the past. So we look at the rate of progress in the past, we make a prediction, and most of the time, we really underestimate what will happen because of the acceleration. And even if we look at the progress that was made uh, today, like what is the current uh, progress rate today, that still un underestimates. And usually, you know, we, we have to account for the fact that it's going to keep on accelerating. And, and the reason for this is because um, in terms of technology, whenever you develop a technology, then you can use it to develop the next one. And then the next one will be used to develop the next, next one and, and, and so on. And, and that's how you can get some acceleration. But the problem with this is now everyone has is a question, well, when is this acceleration going to stop? Because as humans, you know, we have some limitations in terms of our capabilities and for adaptation and, and for leveraging all of this technology, right? So are we going to have, you know, unbounded acceleration or is this going to stop? And, and then so his prediction was that it will be unbounded in the sense that um, even though we have physical limitations, this is where humans are going to merge with machine intelligence. And, and then uh, at that point, you see machine intelligence is going to compensate for those uh, limitations and, and things are just going to keep going. So I guess we're going to augment ourselves then with uh, capabilities that come from machines and, and, and that's why we're going to be able to keep uh, accelerating. Okay, so in any case, this was uh, very interesting in, in 2005. And um, now today, uh, we are indeed experiencing really fast technological growth, and a lot of it is due to artificial intelligence. Now, if we look more carefully, what exactly is happening in terms of AI? So uh, within AI, there's machine learning, and, and then, um, but more broadly, I guess um, in computer science, what we used to do, uh, and, and is still essentially the main subject of, of a bachelor's degree, is, is how to program a computer. So, so the idea is that um, with technology, with computers, there's somebody that has to specify a set of instructions. And, and then so if there's a task, then the programmer has to figure out what instructions the computer should follow and, and then code them and, and the computer will follow that, right? Um, now, the problem with this is that for a complicated task, the programmer has to figure out what's the right set of instructions and that might not be obvious. So, so now with machine learning, we actually have a new paradigm where uh, instead of specifying the instructions, then the computer is fed with a bunch of examples and then it will figure out on its own what are the right instructions to follow in order to replicate uh, these types of examples. And here what I mean by examples is that we have examples of inputs and outputs. So like, let's say we want to do machine translation. So here we can see that uh, there's some input uh, of, of one language, output of another language. Right. And then so if you feed in a lot of pairs of, of sentences like this, then the machine can figure out uh, some function that will map sentences from one language to, to the other. And what's interesting is that for decades, computational linguists and and uh, also uh, researchers in AI failed to uh, specify manually what the instructions should be. But then when you instead um, provide the examples, then we have instead some uh, higher level programs that will then uh, figure out what are the right instructions for that. So this is very interesting because now the programming is sort of like done at a meta level and, and then it allows us to um, uh, come up with solutions that the programmer does not know ahead of time. So same thing in computer vision. 
Um, so you have examples of images and, and, and objects with their classes. And, and then again, uh, researchers and practitioners had trouble specifying instructions by hand, but instead uh, simply by uh, feeding some examples, the machine can, can figure out what's the right thing to do. So that has unlocked all kinds of possibilities. And, and then machine learning is really changing computer science and uh, many things uh, just based on that. Uh, so here, one thing that we could argue is that maybe the singularity that a lot of people have been talking about is really a notion of self-evolving computer systems because now the computers are not being held back by the limitations of their programmers. The computers can essentially uh, program themselves through machine learning. Uh, now, when we look at machine learning, there's there's really uh, several different uh, paradigms for machine learning, and and so far in the industry, what has been the most successful is what would be known as supervised learning. So it's a mild form of machine learning in the sense that uh, we have some inputs and we have the outputs. So these are the examples as I was discussing before, and then the machine will essentially figure out what are the instructions, so the predictor that maps the inputs to the outputs. But here this predictor is, is, is static, right? So it just it will just learn to map inputs to outputs and that's all it's going to do. But now if it has already this capability, perhaps it could do more than that. And, and then there's also reinforcement learning where the, um, here there's a feedback loop and the system is, is not static, but it's dynamic in the sense that it will produce some outputs, often referred to as actions. They influence what the environment is. The environment provides some feedback, and then this feedback is then used for the system to change how it uh, uh, makes predictions, how it chooses actions, and, and then it can improve. So, so then um, this leads to a, a notion of self-evolution, which is quite interesting. So um, yeah, in, in, in the uh, industry now, there's a lot of companies that are starting to leverage this. So we've seen this in the context of robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles, operations research, finance, uh, conversational agents, etc. Okay, so if we keep going, um, now one concrete example where uh, this type of self-evolution really made a big difference was in the context of computer Go. Um, so a few years ago, DeepMind developed AlphaGo, and then AlphaGo was initially composed of a, a supervised learning module that learned to imitate human experts. But as you can imagine, if you want to play well in a game, and in fact, beat the experts, you can't just learn to mimic them, you have to develop your own strategy. And this is where reinforcement learning really played an important role. And uh, the, the computer was able to develop its own strategy by doing some self play and essentially having its own feedback loop so that it could evolve its, its own strategy. So this was very interesting because in, in 2016, uh, there was a, a tournament between AlphaGo and Lee Seedal, so five games. Uh, AlphaGo won four of those, but what's really uh, important is that in game two, uh, move 37, where AlphaGo positioned this black stone at this spot here, if, um, if you know a little bit about Go uh, and you've played, uh, you, you've, you realize that the, placing a stone at this location is actually not a common move. So experts would not do this. And in fact, when AlphaGo placed the stone at this location, there were commentators in the tournament who paused, scratched their heads and then thought, hmm, this is a really odd move. And it looks like AlphaGo just made a mistake. Why is it doing this? But then um, at the same time, everyone was thinking, well, what if this was not a mistake? And you can see here Lee Sidal, who was playing against AlphaGo, scratching his head and asking himself that question. And he actually paused for quite some time before making the next move. And it was never really clear throughout the game what that, the impact of that move would be. But uh, in, after the game, there was a lot of analysis done and, and it was demonstrated that um, this move actually gave an important advantage to AlphaGo and, and uh, effectively helped it win, to, win, win this uh, particular game. So this is an instance where um, in order to defeat humans, you see, we, we had a machine that essentially learned by itself 
and um, it was done through reinforcement learning. And in fact, after that, DeepMind developed Alpha Zero, which was another program that did no supervised learning anymore. It was entirely uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so this notion of self-evolution uh, is actually now starting to become adopted in various parts of, of the industry. So one important part is if we look at um, networks. So at the moment, uh, networking companies are, are deploying 5G networks. And what that really means is that they have as a target to achieve a capacity of 20 gigabytes per second. So that's the speed they want and, and also to enable the Internet of Things. So this is nice. There's lots of benefits to this. But then if we look further at 6G networks, so all those companies are also currently working on, on the next generation, so 6G networks, and often they will use the uh, expression that uh, now this is about an evolution from connectivity to intelligence because once you have a lot of capacity a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth and and so on what are you going to do with this right so there should be some benefit and, and at some level with all of this data that can be transferred in different parts of the network you should be able to do some more intelligent things and and then furthermore you'd like your network to be adaptive to self-diagnose itself self-manage itself and and evolve uh, accordingly so a lot of companies are actually now starting to use reinforcement learning for, for this. Um, let me talk about another sector. Uh, so in Canada, the financial industry is very important. Um, and here, there's an interesting evolution as well. So if we look at the past, um, so financial services, there was really no AI or, or machine learning. Uh, so there were decision makers and the idea is that you can think of financial services as a reallocation of assets from A to B. So whenever there's a transaction is because you're reallocating the assets from A to B. And, and then this reallocation it was decided by uh, an analyst, a decision maker, and, and that's, that's how things were, were done. Okay. Now, at the moment, there's a lot of data-driven services. So to make investments, to decide on loans, uh, decide on various transactions, often predictive models are going to be used. And, and then so the data informs those decisions and, and then you can obtain um, uh, some uh, productivity gains or, or so, some gains in, in general by, by doing this. But it doesn't have to stop here. So now, in fact, the industry is trying to look at how it can personalize these services, make them adaptive, make them self-evolving. Um, so this is happening in part because, um, um, well, OK, hi historically for the industry, there's a, 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 there was often a need to scale and to have a product that fits everyone, right? So you want to have a mass production and, and that's how you can have really economies of scale. But if on the other hand, you could uh, allow the product to be tailored, uh, to be personalized to each user, right? Then you could have something that still scales and yet is unique to each person. So that opens up all kinds of possibilities. In a case of financial services, when you think about it, uh, what is a, a service? It's, it, it can be personalized very easily simply by changing the terms of the contract, changing the interest rate, changing the condition. So it's, it's a bunch of powers that, that can be adjusted. And, and then so there's a, there's a lot of possibilities here. And then same thing happens in, in marketing, right? So you'd like the marketing to take into account um, what are the preferences and, and, and what is the situation of, of each user? And, and again, uh, here by leveraging data from uh, different users, you can adapt the services in, in, in this way. Um, so yeah, so then we're seeing a move towards these more personalized and adaptive services. That's for the financial industry, but also many industries, but especially the financial industry. OK, so here, um, without going into the details of any specific uh, uh, application, what, what we've seen is that with AI, there are lots of successes and, and they uh, have um, really changed things in, in many application domains. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly natural language processing. So here that has completely um, 
uh, like there have been some some major breakthroughs where uh, machines did not used to be able to uh, do translation or understand users very well, but now translation, uh, conversational agents, uh, also uh, just finding information in lots of documents works nicely. OK, so so NLP has been revolutionized and 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 every company uh, typically has some documents or has some textual data and and then otherwise there might be like uh, conference calls or or some uh, also uh, uh, audio data that that can be leveraged and and there are often some interesting things that that can be done to improve decision making and, and services based on that. Uh, in, in the same way, if there's data that consists of images, then vision um, plays an important role. And, and it used to be that computers uh, could not understand much out of an image, but now they can recognize objects, they can track people. Uh, there's lots that, that, that can be done. And, and then so AI has really changed the possibilities and opened up uh, many uh, avenues there. Uh, we see some similar things in robotics. So here robotics, it used to be again that um, programmers would uh, write down some instructions and they'd have to kind of like specify what the robot would do. But now instead uh, via machine learning, this can be done at, at um, the meta level. And uh, that means that uh, you provide examples or otherwise you let the machine optimize what's the right sequence of instructions that it needs to execute. So a lot more task and robotics can be uh, tackled in, in this fashion. OK, so I already talked quite a bit about finance, so I won't uh, talk more about this. In health, there's something similar happening where um, there's a personalized medicine that is taking off. And, and now the idea is that you'd like to have treatments that are really tailored, take into account um, what are the, um, uh, I guess, the, uh, the properties of, of each user so that you have uh, treatments that are uh, more fine-tuned, more uh, adequate, and and then so there's a lot of pr uh, promise. Uh, uh, at least there's a lot of hope for uh, treatments that will be better and more effective in, in this way. Um, yeah. So so when you look um, out there, uh, you can take pretty much any sector of the economy, and uh, often either due to the type of data that they have or the type of decision that they need to make, uh, AI can play a role, and there's some opportunities there. So in, in general, we could say now that AI machine learning are really like um, uh, the foundation for a lot of uh, the work in data science, at least in terms of predictive analytics. As I mentioned, we can now personalize a lot of the services and then you can also have things that are adaptive, which was not possible before. So this is really opening up a lot of possibilities. OK, so I guess, um, yeah, that's I, I've talked about uh, AI successes at, at a high level like this. And uh, but now let's also talk about some of the failures. So um, there's uh, I, I guess for every success out there, there are some failures. Uh, most of them never get reported, but there's actually a few of them that have been uh, reported in the media quite well. And it's interesting to look at, at what they are. Um, so I talked a lot about uh, self-evolving or adaptive system. So the first failure that, uh, or example of a failure for this that might come to your mind is a few years ago, Microsoft released a, a chatbot called Tay, and, and then um, it actually uh, did this type of self-evolution, but it went out of control and, and, and then it went bad. So I'll, I'll talk more about this. Uh, LG also had, um, uh, an IoT AI insist assistant that failed in, in a major um, uh, demo that the company tried to do. Um, in terms of financial investment, um, there are some investors that uh, retain the services of Tinderist, so that's an investment firm that uh, uses AI for the investment. And at least in one case, uh, there's a, a client that is suing the company uh, because it lost $20 million due to bad decisions from, from AI. Uh, in terms of computer vision, there's a lot of questioning about uh, facial recognition. So facial recognition uh, has, has been used by law enforcement and also for uh, identifying users, and it doesn't always work. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these. And then in the context of health, uh, at some point, IBM had this uh, really um, 
a popular system, Watson, that showed that it was quite knowledgeable by participating in Jeopardy and beating all the human players. Uh, and then the idea was that then Watson presumably has a lot of knowledge and could be used for um, some interesting purposes, like in health to uh, make some recommendations for treatments. And, and then so IBM actually uh, launched two projects for this in the context of cancer treatments, so oncology, and unfortunately they both failed. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, so um, yeah, the first one here that I have about self-evolution gone bad is this example from Microsoft. So it launched this uh, chatbot called Tay. Uh, so it was an experimental chatbot, and what was special about it was that it could learn from its conversation with users. And, and the idea is that you see if you design a chatbot, uh, at the beginning you see it might not be able to say things that are very interesting, but then in the same way that humans learn by interacting with other people, you would like the chatbot to do the same thing. And so Microsoft was a experimenting with that. And the problem that it ran into is that the users uh, were, were really adversarial and essentially told the bot a bunch of uh, things that were not good, uh, like uh, racist comments, uh, sexual comments, and, and things like that. And then within 24 hours, they became a racist and sexually charged chatbot, and Microsoft had to take it down. Now, uh, despite this failure, I, we should also highlight the fact that Microsoft has had some successful chatbots. So uh, one of them in China is, is Xiao Xie, and then there's another one called Zo. So those chatbots uh, ran without any problem uh, for many years. And and um, yeah, so I guess I guess here it's not uh, all that bad. Okay. Um, okay, and another example of um, uh, a failure was an unresponsive dialogue system that was uh, demonstrated by LG. So I'll just quickly show a video about this. So it's, uh, uh, I guess- Allow uh, me to introduce yeah. Chloe. Hello, Chloe. Good morning, Dave. I hope you're well. What can I do for you today? What's my schedule? You need to go to the gym at 10 a.m. today. Power up. Power up. Smart Learner has set the washer to the sportswear setting. Chloe, am I ready on my washing cycle? Even robots have bad days. Chloe, what's for dinner tonight? Okay, Chloe is not going to talk to me. Chloe doesn't like me, evidently. It looks like we should use the chicken. Chloe, are you talking to me yet? What recipes could I make with chicken? Okay, we're going to search recipes and we're going to find buffalo chicken pizza. This smart kitchen is changing the game. It's doing it all for you seamlessly and effortlessly. All right, so yeah, so this is an example of a, a demonstration that did not go well. Uh, it's unclear what exactly went wrong. Maybe it wasn't so much the AI here, maybe there was some other technical difficulties, but in any case, uh, uh, live demos always uh, tricky to do. Uh, let's move on to another. Allow me to Oops. introduce Chloe. Let me stop this. Okay. Uh, I need to move to the next slide. And okay, there we go. So okay, so next uh, example that I've got is in the context of finance. So there was a Bloomberg story uh, recently where there was um, a Hong Kong real estate tycoon. His name was uh, Samantar Lee Kim Kam. And then he filed a lawsuit for $23 million against uh, the CEO and founder of Tinderis Investments. So Tinderis is essentially a firm that does um, offer financial services for investments using uh, an AI platform called K1. 
and and then at least in, in the lawsuit it, it explains that uh, it made some bad decisions that resulted in a loss of 20 million dollars so here i i don't know what exactly were, were the bad decisions what might have gone wrong uh, but it's it's an example and and perhaps here when it comes to uh, uh, investments. On the other hand, one should also see that there's obviously a risk. Um, so there's a lot of automated trading that is very successful. So a lot of financial companies uh, uh, are in fact being uh, very successful in, in, in that respect. But obviously with those successes, there must be some other uh, bad stories. And this is one example here. Um, okay, in the context of computer vision, uh, facial recognition has been an important application. And, and in particular here, there's a story about Amazon's recognition system. So it, it was used or it was promoted for law enforcement. So the idea is that uh, there's a database of uh, images of people that have been arrested. And, and sometimes you want to see where those people are out there and you want to compare that to other images that you might get uh, and, and so that you can locate th those people. And then just as an exercise, um, there was an organization uh, called ACLU, so, <coughs> so it's an association for uh, liberties in, in the US and, and then um, they showed that if they took uh, images of uh, Congress members, then uh, there were 28 of them that the system matched to uh, arrested people, the mock shots of arrested people. And, and then beyond just the fact that uh, it thought that a lot of those people might be uh, uh, villains, it also uh, had a higher error rate. In fact, an error rate that was almost twice as high for people of color. So they notice that you see among the members of the Congress are 20 percent of them that are people of color. But then among those where it made a false match, there were 39 percent of them that were people of color. So, so there's also a bias or at least the machines were not as um, uh, accurate um, with people of color, which is really problematic. Uh, now, facial recognition has also been fooled uh, by various researchers in other types of application, not just matching people, but let's say if you want to confirm the identity of a person. So now there's uh, all kinds of systems that have been deployed around the world, in some cases in airports for passport control, and also with some payment systems. So Alipay and WeChat have some mobile payment systems that use facial recognition. And then so there's some uh, researchers at Neron who um, essentially just uh, produce some um, uh, 3D um, uh, masks of uh, some people and then of, of themselves, I guess. And, and then they, they essentially show that the mask could be used to uh, fool the software and thinking that this is a real person. Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, this is not perfect. And um, this highlights the, the problem that when you deploy systems in the wild with users, there will be users who will be adversarial and might want to uh, fool the system in various ways. And, and then um, a lot of our assumptions in machine learning might not hold. So this is problematic. Um, OK, let me give you one last example um, regarding this time health. So IBM Watson in 2011 defeated some of the uh, top contestants in Jeopardy, where Jeopardy is this uh, well-known show, a television show where people essentially demonstrate that they have a lot of knowledge uh, on various topics. So that demonstrated that IBM had developed a machine that had a lot of knowledge, and then it started to market it for various purposes, like helping uh, to uh, recommend treatments in, in cancer. So uh, IBM launched two projects. One of them was called Watson for Oncology. The other one was called Oncology Expert Advisor. And, and these projects were in fact in collaboration with um, uh, some medical research team at, at various hospitals in, in the United States and various universities. And in the second case, there was uh, $62 million that was in fact invested. And then both projects today have been shelved uh, due to problems in terms of uh, the recommendations that were made. So the recommendations were, were not uh, reliable. And, and here, you know, there's high risk because these are, are health treatments. And, and then so the, uh, the technology was just not ready for that. Okay, so to 
I, I guess when we look at um, the successes and, and the failures, so in the context of failures, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why the AI could fail. I, I guess in some cases it could just be that there's a mismatch between the expectations um, of uh, you know the business people and, and then what the technology can really deliver. But in other cases, um, it's really that the, the technology has some, some problems. And, and then at least when we look at what has been developed, uh, for AI, for, for machine learning, um, one, well, at least three common problems across the board that will often lead to issues in, in terms of deployment are, are listed here. So robustness, fairness, explainability. So by robustness, what I mean is that um, uh, because we're training um, these systems with examples, the problem is it's never clear that we have fed enough examples or that uh, there will not be examples that are of a different nature in practice once we deploy. So there's always a risk that uh, there will be un unforeseen predictions that are bad predictions in, in the future. So, so developing some machine learning technique that is robust is in fact quite challenging. But then in, in that respect, there is some work uh, to address this. Uh, so there's a whole field now uh, that focuses on adversarial training. And here the idea is that in machine learning, we typically assume that the predictions will have to be made with respect to a certain distribution of examples. But obviously if that distribution is not an accurate distribution or if there's some villains out there that are trying to be adversarial that they want to fool your, your system, then you have to account for the worst case. And, and then so adversarial training now looks at ways to do training for the worst case. So this is one aspect. Um, another aspect is AI verification. So typically with software, there's a whole field on software verification, but a lot of the techniques for that don't port easily to AI. So at the moment there's a lack um, for, for this and a lot of people in fact working on, on addressing that. Uh, but going forward, I, I believe that these two will gradually help to mitigate th those problems. Um, okay, another one is fairness. So we saw that uh, in the context of facial recognition, um, then there was uh, there could be a bias with respect to uh, uh, races, and and then there was another example I didn't talk about, but uh, for hiring. Uh, so this was at Amazon. They also had. Uh, uh, some computer system to uh, filter different uh, applications and then there would be a gender bias uh, as a result of, of their system. So here um, coming up with systems that are fair or systems that are not biased is actually uh, challenging and, and then for this there's now a whole field uh, focus on machine learning fairness and also uh, causality, so causal machine learning. Um, okay, the last one, explainability, is also very important because often you have systems that make recommendations, make decisions, but they're not obvious and we don't know if they're right or wrong. And then just following those recommendations might be disastrous, right? So how can we explain or how can we um, essentially understand what the machine is doing? So there's now a whole field. Uh, this is very popular. In, in natural language processing and also computer vision that's looking at developing what are known as probing techniques and also auxiliary objectives that can provide explanations. Um, okay, so let me just show you an example of this type of probing. So this is some work that I've done a few years ago with uh, some students in my group. Um, so let's say that we're doing um, some reinforcement learning and we want to develop some strategy to play some, some video games. So I've got four video games here. On the left side, we've got uh, the uh, regular screen of, of each video game. On the right side, we've got the result of a probe. And the probe here is essentially showing what the system is able to track with respect to the video in, in the game. So a lot of those um, reinforcement learning techniques, they're black box techniques, and, and they will play well but we never know when they're gonna fail or why they're not doing what they're expected to do and, and so on. But now with this, what we've shown is that um, this technique can show uh, in real time um, what are the moving objects. And then that information is information that is used by the reinforcement learning agent 
to make its decision. And then so it's if it's tracking the right objects, then it gives us some sense that it will likely do the right thing. But if it's tracking the wrong objects, then it might not perform well. So when you look at those videos, you see the first three, it's it's tracking the right things. If you look at the fourth one here, Beam Rider, it's actually tracking those vertical lines, uh, sorry, those horizontal lines that are flowing down. And these are really just a visual artifact in the game. So you can see immediately that it's actually tracking things that are irrelevant. And as a result, what we've noticed is that in this particular game, we were not obtaining good results, and that was part of the reason. So, yeah, so this illustrates what, what we can do in, in terms of probing. And, and just for the sake of uh, 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 completeness, um, let me just show you here the architecture of our network. So this was a, a deep neural network. Um, it, it had some convolutions. And then the probe is essentially the right part of this network. So normally when you process some images, you might have some convolutional layers, they compute some features, so they compute some information, but we don't know really what that means. And what we did is we added the right part here, which is the probe, and that computes what are the um, uh, object uh, uh, translation. So that means the motion of, of each object as well. As that's the location of each object, and that's what we're seeing uh, in the right-hand side. So I guess more concretely, you see the system would take as input two frames, it would compute masks and also motion, and that's that's what we're seeing here. So that, that was the pro. So this is an example of how we can make black box technique become ex more explainable, at least more understandable. Okay, so um, let me stop here, and let me conclude by saying that um, AI has led to a revolution. In fact, uh, some people call it the fourth industrial revolution. So other people ask whether this is uh, not a technological singularity. But in any case, with all that progress, there's obviously some failures. And then, so we saw some examples of them. Uh, in many cases, there's some misunderstanding about the AI limitations, but some important limitations that are really across the board are really this lack of robustness, fairness, explainability. So that's what I, I focused on today. And I gave you an example at least of uh, some of the work that can be done to at least mitigate some, some of those uh, some of those issues. So again, let me stop here and let me just ask to conclude, what is your experience? So have you had some successes or some failures and what are you doing to address them? Okay. Thank you, Pascal. That was very good. And um, so are, are there any comments or questions? Uh, I mean, I could start off with uh, the Microsoft chatbot was an interesting example. It, be, it was in, due to adversaries. Um, now, is there a technological fix there? Is, are there chatbots that are uh, evolutionary, that like self-evolving, but that don't go down the road of sexist and racist behavior? Uh, are there, is it, or is it sort of inherent in, um, in, in the self-evolving framework that this will happen? Right, so um, I, I don't think it's inherent to the self-evolving framework per se. Um, so it all depends how you use, um, I guess, the, so at, at least, okay, we, we don't know for sure how exactly T was working, but what seemed to be the case is that uh, messages that were written by users to T could then be used more or less uh, to, to uh, produce responses back by T, right? And, and here, they're, instead of like responding with more or less the same messages or excerpts from, from those messages, right? Um, there could be ways in which we could instead use the messages to fine tune some powders, but, but then those powders never lead to uh, the generation of, of, of the same type of text. So, so there are ways in which we can limit the vocabulary. There are ways in which we can uh, limit the, the 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 type of output, and um, uh, that that can be successful. Now, after the the problems with Tay, Microsoft did launch another bot called Zo, um, and I don't know to what extent it might have been learning from um, from users, but uh, in any case, that bot had no problem. And, and it worked out just fine. Okay, so we're almost out of time here, but uh, let me squeeze in one or two questions as well. 
So we have had it. Here's the question. We have had issues with getting other teams within the company to trust the models because of lack of explainability. So can you can you talk about that for a bit? What are some of the other ways to make AI more explainable? You talked about probing. Um, what are some of the other techniques for explainability? OK, <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I guess I would depend a lot on what is the type of model. Um, yeah, so so probing ha has uh, emerged as um, uh, a general technique because it can be com it can be combined with pretty much anything. But if on the other hand you have, um, uh, let's say, a, a system where you can expose some parts of what it computes and and make that easily understandable by by humans, like by displaying some of that information, that intermediate information. This this would help and in general that at least in, in working with uh, various companies for for that uh, but okay as, as another example so i am working with uh, sport logic and and that's a company that does sports analytics there we have important uh, problems because we can make predictions about uh, different outcomes for games we can also make uh, some recommendations about what uh, some players should do to improve their play but then often you know the uh, players themselves the coaches the fans the experts will question whether those recommendations are are are, are good ones right and and generally speaking often the strategy boils down to how we can augment the prediction with additional information that could justify why that might be a good thing. So like if we think a play, uh, uh, yeah, different play would have been better, then we could, you know, show like future uh, trajectories or outcomes um, after that play to justify why that might be a better play. Right. And and then at the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't mean humans are going to believe it or, or still agree with it, but at least you can explain in, 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 in this way. Right. So often it's it's more a question of providing additional information and, and yeah, that, that will depend a lot on, on the type of model you have. OK, thanks. I see we're out of time, so maybe I'll end with a, a comment and I'll let you respond. So uh, sometimes failure is in the eye of the beholder. For me, the YouTube recommendation engine is a, is both a, f a failure and a success uh, because I spend far too much time watching backpacking videos, and and uh, and so uh, yes, it it's it's spot on, and but it's also uh, encourages me to spend a lot of time uh, uh, on YouTube. So there, you know, in that sense, it's a failure for me and a success for the company. So. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. So it's not necessarily <laughs> just measured in commercial success or not, right? So yeah, yeah, that, that that's a good point. And and I guess here, yeah, one one extreme of this is that recommender systems uh, have been pinpointed, I guess, as uh, also a source of problems for how society has become polarized because then you have some beliefs about, uh, you know, some political issues, so you tend to be recommended by uh, those systems more um, more uh, articles or videos about that and then you reinforce your own belief and then you become polarized right so I guess I guess with backpacking that's not so bad <laughs> but <laughs> when, it, when it comes to political issues sometimes that yeah. can be a bit more problematic and and so uh, I think the industry is aware of this at least uh, I, I know uh, a lot of the social media companies that develop those uh, systems are aware of this, and and there, I guess, I guess the point would be to uh, have systems that make recommendations based on what you like, but also for every recommendation, offer you like a a, a, a different view, a different perspective, the counterpoint, right? So that you have like something that's more balanced. Uh, now the problem is that it's not clear whether this is going to generate the type of uh, uh revenues and and clicks and, and and so on that the industry wants but that would be i guess the uh at least something worth trying yeah, very interesting thanks so uh, yeah thank you again for your talk thank you to all the speakers uh, and so let me just end with an announcement we've got uh, another webinar in our series our last our third one 
is on November 19th at 11.30, and we have a very interesting panel lined up. So uh, we hope to hear or see you there. So bye for now.